Um, my question is for, uh, for the first uh, presentation uh, for the minister. Um, so um, I remember in the presentation, there was some period of time where uh, uh, at that time, the, uh, eco eco the economic growth is high and the poverty uh, reduce is high. Also, the inequality also reduce. But later on, uh, in especially in early 2000, that, that trend is re uh, is reverted for the inequality. So I want to ask, what's the like? What's the main driver uh, driver for this difference? Like, why uh, for some time uh, the uh, the economic growth and uh, inequality reduction can be achieved at the same time, but later on that was not possible. Is it because uh, a, a change in economic growth model or some other reasons? Um, th thank you very much. Um, my, my comment is directed at Um I, I'm in a situation that I have just uh, a couple of months ago uh, been on a, a dissertation committee um, which is exactly on, on the Kagera work. And one key issue that came up in that context was how representative is your final sample actually? Um, because uh, you have a number of things that have happened uh, between then and now, and there's a very high likelihood that the ones who have exited the final sample actually were poorer to begin with. So, so, so I mean, if that's the case, then there is an issue. And I was just wondering whether you had pondered about it. I mean, you may well have investigated, but I didn't, I, I believe I didn't see that in the presentation. Um, the second point very quickly is that uh, in that context I just mentioned, uh, weather came out as an extremely important variable in impacting um, on uh, final outcomes uh, at the end. And I'm just wondering about whether your diversification and whether to begin with, whether they have been uh, quite, quite closely correlated, because if that's the case, then there might be a case for investigating that relationship uh, in the origin of it, uh, because th then, then the sort of uh, direct link that you have from diversification uh, to the final outcomes might actually be, be, I mean, there might be something to be looked into there. Thanks. Uh, I think mine is clarification from the last paper uh, presenter on livelihood. Uh, somewhere uh, within your presentation, you indicated that uh, uh, it came out that everybody was diversified in a way. Uh, then uh, you move on to say that you're going to use uh, uh, that categorization where you are saying that uh, you have one if you are diversified or so whatever not diversified eh? the dummy variable yeah so i think uh, it's maybe i didn't get clearly but i i, I got you saying like everybody was uh, diversified in one way or the other uh, then i was uh, wondering uh, whether uh, now that you're talking about income as you are a key area of uh, diversification, uh, whether you had in mind uh, about uh, uh, rural remittances, I mean the remittances that come from, because that area is specifically a main rural area, and we know you receive rural areas sometimes in Africa receives a lot of remittances. Uh, I don't know whether you really control for that uh, as a way of uh, really looking through your, uh, your income as your key area. Thank you. For Neil, taking advantage of the fact that you're here in, with your experience working for the government, what uh, specific policies do you think might best accelerate reductions in poverty and inequality uh, in Mozambique? But you also, if you have any uh, words on the Tanzania work, that would that would also be great. Then, David, why why do you think was the effect of COVID nineteen so strong amongst the less vulnerable? What kind of mechanisms could have been at play? And if you have any sense for that. And then for uh, Sushmita, you have a positive story about income diversification, but how successful can these strategies be, especially in, in the face of covariate shocks like climate change, or given that this is presumably, I mean, mostly slum areas, these, these are pretty vulnerable households to covariate shocks. And like Finn, I'm slightly worried also about the attrition issue. So if you could say something about that. Okay. Uh, Let's uh, give the word to you, maybe, and start, and any more time will come back to you. Thank you, uh, Patricia. I will uh, ask the question that uh, uh, 
uh, one of the colleagues here arise it. And uh, of course, uh, if needed, uh, Professor Finn can add because he's one of the co-authors of this study. Uh, we had uh, in the beginning of, uh, for this old period that we uh, uh, analyzed, uh, the first period, uh, which is in the 19 years, uh, in fact, we had a poverty reduction and uh, we saw the stable in terms of inequality. This is because of, um, we was uh, coming from a very high uh, rate in terms of poverty because it was after the war, we, we, the country was uh, in general uh, without nothing in terms of uh, education, health, uh, economic infrastructures. So the process to build all these uh, service, let's say, uh, the results was the results was uh, a, a little bit in terms of reducing of poverty because the country has to deal with um, strong, very strong policies in terms of social policy and economic policy, uh, trying to push the country for a high level rates of uh, huge uh, social and economic problems. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, the, and, and the, the process continue for the 15 years uh, in terms of building, bringing all these kind of service that the country needs, uh, specifically in terms of social. Uh, that's why we saw the process of adjusting of uh, poverty continues. Uh, but in Mozambique, we are facing one uh, challenge that I think that the, uh, some of uh, African countries uh, are facing. It's the growth of the population that is growing uh, uh, in terms comparative terms uh, very high. This is a, a, a problem for us in terms of poverty and inequality because the government are not able to provide all these services that we was in the past able to provide in the last, let's say, 10 years. The growth of population is increasing uh, very high and very quickly. This is one of the problem. And we need to transform our economy, in, in fact. Uh, the model that we come uh, with from 19 years, uh, it's not uh, for these years uh, the most, uh, the good models, because we have uh, high levels of uh, inequality because of the growth of the, of the poverty, the, the public service in terms of health, education, it's not enough. So we are facing uh, a lot of challenge in these recent years. That's why uh, we are seeing uh, the increase of this poverty and inequality. And uh, uh, Mozambique, it's a uh, uh, very high vulnerability countries uh, when we talk about external uh, uh, shocks uh, because we highly depend on uh, imports. And uh, uh, when we, we see the problems uh, abroad in, related with the prices of the commodities, all these issues affect uh, our country. So we have to change our economic model, uh, maybe. We have to look of this, uh, let's say, uh, problem of uh, growth of population uh, and other issues related with the prices of the uh, basket of the uh, food for our household and uh, and so on in general terms it's uh, more or less this problem that we're facing that's why uh, you saw in the beginning of the years that we analyze it uh, reducing and now it started to increase but as i said professor finley uh, can add uh, for the question of patricia in terms of police um I think that uh, uh, we in Mozambique we we have uh, to work in in uh, in um, in um, in many in many many ways. Uh, we have to deal with a uh, lot of issues. First, we have to invest in education. Uh, 
uh, this is one of our challenge. Uh, we have to invest in all social service. I'm talking about education, uh, health, and social protection, because we have uh, a, a very, uh, we have huge number of people that we call it vulnerable people. And we ha when we, f we are facing uh, a, a small shock, internal or external, it affects all this uh, population that we call it vulnerable population. So we have to, to have a strong policy in social protections that uh, we can work and deal with these people. Of course, investing in the same time in economic, uh, especially in the economic growth, solid e economic growth. I will, for now, stay, uh, stop here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, replying to the question why the least vulnerable were most affected by COVID. So the short answer is because they happen to be related to work or to be related to the sectors that uh, suffer the first order impacts, the first order economic impacts from the pandemic and the associated measures. So ex elaborating a bit, what we do is we contrast our results from, from our study on the pre-pandemic poverty, dyna uh, poverty dynamics and vulnerability profiles with what we know from external sources on how COVID has affected the economy. No? And these external sources are mainly the economic updates of the World Bank and also the reports by the Bank of Tanzania, also the knowledge of my, uh, of my co-authors that, that uh, are based in, Tan in Tanzania. And from and yes, looking at sectoral data and some small service and so on, what it emerges is that these main effects were in the tourism sector, which but for obvious reasons, because international mobility was heavily restricted. And they also point uh, specifically to urban workers, no, and to mainly to small middle enterprises and to informal urban workers, because even if the lockdown measures were very limited in the case of Tanzania, they still it's it's a still as well it's a more or less generalized pattern no that these sectors are the ones that suffer more from the lockdowns because they face reduced demand and they have the i mean the well for informal workers work can just be interrupted small middle enterprises uh, can face more difficulties to survive this period so we know from external sources these are the 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 sectors that are most directly affected by by the economic consequences of the pandemic. Now, if we look at our results, well, it, it turns out that uh, persistent poverty and also vulnerability have a very marked rural agricultural character and that uh, especially formal workers and urban people in urban sectors, but also uh, like, let's say, yes, so people living in rural areas with non-farm jobs or informal workers in general have a much more favorable situation at the, at the, uh, at the beginning than uh, people, for instance, in agriculture. So that's a bit like the message that emerges, that in general, the people who face these first order impacts that have been identified elsewhere uh, are different from the people that we identify as vulnerable. One result, I didn't emphasize it that much, but where there's some overlap is export-oriented agriculture, which also seems to have suffered a lot. And there we don't see that there the vulnerability patterns are a bit in line with the national average. That's uh, like one result where one type of uh, sector affected by COVID where they wouldn't be better off, let's say, at the, at the beginning. But in general, the message that emerges, what I found again. Thank you. Uh, so thanks, Finn, for the questions. They are spot on. <laughs> so about the representativeness of the data, I, I agree, but that's the best what we can do, given the, the state of panel data of, of developing countries we have at the moment. Uh, according, we went through the data manual, data collection manual quite thoroughly, and it seems that uh, the attrition rate of the households that were interviewed the most in the baseline, they had the least attrition. So that's the best uh, uh, we can offer at the moment. But of course, we have to keep this caveat in mind and reflect on this in the paper. 
that's um, that that we do. So yeah, we we have to put a discussion section on this, and then the weather in regions could affect the results. Yes, I agree. Uh, for now, with the diversification variable and also the baseline income of the main households, what we do is that we pool the uh, the income of across all the four panels because they were also biannually collected and each probably different regions had different months and that uh, so what we do is pull them together for the four waves and the diversification index also come from that pool data so that's what we do to minimize the weather variability and probably that also points out to the covariate shocks a bit that's that's what we do so far. And yes, and we also have the regular controls and we have the control for at region level, like not, not at district level, but, a, but one tier below that. So that's what we have so far. Yes, and about the remittances, I think I just used a different word. I, I said rents and transfers, but we do have that as well as one of the six main income sources. So, so we have the income sources which are contributing to more than 10% of the total household income. And yes, remittances is one of the uh, main sources there. Yes, and Patricia's question, I, I partly answered, I, I hope. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Actually, I have not understood your answer to covariant risk. So, like uh, in the case of drought, or uh, or a virus, everyone is affected. So, in that case, diversification does not help. Or, or, because you are assuming that uh, over time, those uh, like in droughts will be rare events. But these days, they are, in, they are quite common. So diversification there may, may not help. The other question I had is, uh, how, how did you use uh, PSM, propensity, propensity score matching? To address the selection problem, because you said you are you, you are using the PSM to address the selection issue. How, how did you do it? Yes, yes, and indeed, no. I think my question is for uh, Anilda. Uh, just on the, on, I think the point you made around, you know, poverty and inequality increasing um, and increasing alongside the population growth that we see in Mozambique in the post-war period. And when I say war, I mean, I don't mean the current conflict, but I think post the sort of Renamo, um, you know, issues that there were. Um, and I think now with a lot of the natural resource discoveries that have been seen both on the coastline and what we see also happening in global gas markets, um, what do you think at a policy level can be done to make sure that at least some of the upside associated, uh, you know, with some of those discoveries and even the existing, you know, uh, uh, gas fines um, in Mozambique um, can avert what is often called the resource curse, but also include um, some form of equitable distribution that can deal with some of the spatial inequalities that you were talking about. Th thanks. My, my mine is really just a, a sort of a, a, a comment. Um, first on uh, the uh, synthetic panel. Uh, th there is a parallel study uh, on Mozambique, actually, uh, to the one for Tanzania, and it's kind of interesting uh, that there are some differences that do appear uh, from sort of at least sort of looking at it to be related to the fact that uh, Tanzania followed, um, uh, let's put it this way, quite irresponsible policies. Um, I mean, the chair of the wider board died, uh, and quite a number of uh, people from the former sector in Tanzania died because they were not allowed to recognize uh, COVID as a problem. 
So, I mean, uh, and, and it's very interesting to see that there are some, uh, how can I say, discrepancies, if you wish to put it that way, between Mozambique and Tanzania, which, which probably can be traced to that. So it, there's an interesting sort of thing there which one might want to look into more, more systematically. Um, I just want to stress that inequality has not gone down in Mozambique. Inequality has gradually been sneaking up and then unfortunately it now seems to be moving faster up than it has before. When it comes to poverty, the trend has basically been down, down, then flat because of international price increases and then down again, but now up. So that's sort of the, and the last question that's raised is a very important question raised very directly to these issues. Thanks. Okay, and I was going to suggest that maybe in the last 30 seconds, Enil, maybe you address that question, and I suggest Susmita and the gentleman there discuss the, the technical details of a coffee. So if you don't mind, I'll skip the last one. Yes, thank you, Patricia. I, I don't have, uh, let's say, the right answer for this question, because now we are in Mozambique, we are discussing about this uh, new discover and, uh, and, and, and LNG, uh, uh, how the country will use properly this resource to solve the problems that we have, uh, especially in terms of uh, poverty, inequality. So we don't have the right question, the, the right uh, model now. We are trying to see what other countries with this resource are doing. Uh, but uh, the discussion is about uh, if do we use the model of um, monetary transfer directly for the household. Uh, in some countries, this model works well. We, we have this in the table we are discussing. Uh, or we will invest through the budget in the infrastructures, uh, education with the focus in the education and the health. Uh, so now we think that uh, uh, the, the revenue that will come from this resource, uh, in fact, will help the country to improve these uh, uh, indicators that are not uh, performing well, but uh, we still don't have uh, the right model, uh, but we think that it will improve uh, if uh, we use this uh, resource properly uh, with a good model. This is what I can say now. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. And if I ask everyone for a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you very much.